All right, so you guys might find this interesting. I don't know if you will or you will not. Um, I do. I think that scientific um, history is really interesting, and, and quite honestly, it's pretty interesting how this whole idea of microbiology developed. Um, it has some complex origins. And, of course, may, most people would start off by talking about Robert Hooke. So, he was English, he was very famous, he created Hooke's Law, and but he, what he's famous for in terms of microbiology is he... Um, observed the first cells. Okay, he cut a piece of cork and he also was involved with designing compound light microscope. There's some debate as to whether or not his was as efficient as um, von Leeuwenhoek, but you know, still, it doesn't uh, really matter. The bottom line is he observed the first, uh, he also observed the first microbes. I should put that out there because sometimes people get this confused. Um, the microbes he observed though were not bacteria. They were mold. They were bread mold. You know, common bread mold that grows on your bread when you leave it in the, um, you know, in the bread jar too long or whatever. Um, so anyway, he did observe the first cells though, and that was usually uh, that was a piece of cork. He cut a piece of cork. He started looking in there. So what he was really observing was you know, uh, empty cells. It was a cell wall remnants. But still, he observed the first cells, and that's where they get their name and all that such. So he was an interesting guy. And this other guy here, von Leeuwenhoek, in, or however you want to say his name, von Leeuwenhoek, um, he was the first individual to observe a single-celled microbe. All right? So that's the bottom line. He observed bacteria, and he spent a long time doing this. I mean, he used to make these really um, very, very well-ground lenses. And he used a single-lens microscope, very, very simple procedure. And he used to take grind, uh, scrapings from his teeth, his blood, his feces, whatever he felt like looking at. And he, and he realized that all of these things were teeming with life, and he, and, he, and he drew pictures and sent it out, but, you know, really wasn't recognized until, um, until uh, I believe it was Hook, who talked to him and said, you know, this is really great stuff, you're doing some good science here, it's interesting. So, um, one of the long-held beliefs, I mean, this might, you might not believe that people once thought this, but it's true that they did. Um, they believed that there was this idea of spontaneous generation, okay? And that is that life simply arose without parent organisms. Life arose from nothing, essentially. So what you could do is you could put meat outside and it would spontaneously generate maggots or something like that. And people really believed this for a long time. And it wasn't until Louis Pasteur, okay, who was very famous for all different kinds of stuff, mostly pasteurization, um, but regardless, he, he came up with this idea that he was going to disprove spontaneous generation, okay? And so how did he go about doing it? Well, what, what, he, what he noticed first was he made some classic observations. One, if you had a sealed flask and you had some broth, you know, beef broth or something, that would normally grow organisms, microorganisms, grow bacteria, mold, etc., leaving it out, that if you actually took this and you boiled it and it was in a sealed flask, no microbes grew, but then, if you were to take that same thing, okay, if you were to do the same thing here, and you were to leave it open, boil it, and leave it sit, you would notice that it would be very cloudy, and that cloudiness is bacteria. I mean, that's one of the ways in which we, um, you know, measure the number of cells. We can look at how cloudy it is. You can use um, a spectrophotometer or something like that, or a spectrophotron, um, something along those lines, to, uh, to uh, measure how many cells are in this um, are in this sample based on you know sort of how cloudy it is and then that's you know that's layman's terms of course it's not the details but it's an interesting concept so anyway after that he decided that you know he would by proving those two things people were still weren't convinced so they knew that if you had a sealed flask you boiled the liquid it didn't grow anything you let you boil it and you leave it open it grows microbes Okay, people didn't believe that. They said spontaneous generation requires oxygen. So what did he do? He came up with this idea of a swan neck flask. Okay, and then basically it's just an S-shaped flask. I mean, it's really nothing fancy. I mean, I'll try and just give you guys an idea of what this thing looked like. I mean, it was nothing really special. But at the time, it was a really novel idea. Okay, and it had this S-shaped curve here. And what would happen is the microbes and dust and dirt and everything would get caught in this S-shaped spot right here. All right, and that would prevent um, them from colonizing the broth. But it was still exposed to oxygen, so he could disprove the critics that were saying, you know, it needed oxygen and such. So that's kind of his contribution here. 
Now, everybody's heard of this today, but at the time, people didn't really understand it. But this is this idea of the germ theory of disease, okay? So that's the theory that disease is caused by microbes, okay? Disease is caused by microbes. Nowadays, we know that bacteria are pathogenic in some cases and, and such are, are um, pathogenic. And we also know that archaea are not pathogenic. So that's an interesting fact as well for you. Um, anyway... So we have this guy, Robert Koch, okay, and he came up with these Koch pot postulates, okay, and basically what that did was it, in, it established a causative link between the infectious agent and the disease, okay, so it, it established a causative link between the infectious agent and the disease, and he came up with these sort of four, you know, they're not steady terms because they don't always apply, so I want to make that clear now. Um, there are things that don't that are disease causing that don't fit in this process. But anyway, what he discovered was that if you had somebody or or had an animal that was sick or something that you were studying, that if the microbe was found in all infected individuals but not found in healthy individuals, then you know this microbe was most likely a good you know a good first place to start. Um, so if you had some infection. You were, you know, the animal was sick, let's say, you extract the blood, you find some microbe in it or whatever, and, um, and you, and basically you look around and you see, well, okay, here's a healthy animal and I check the healthy animal and I don't find the microbe. So that became the first postulate was that, you know, it had to, the, the microbe had to be present in an infected individual and had to be absent in a healthy individuals. And that was in all cases. So what he would do next then was you need to grow this thing in pure culture, okay? So the microbe had to be isolated from the host and grown in pure culture. Um, essentially what I mean by that is you're, you're taking it, you're culturing it, and today we do that by, today we do that by streaking a plate or um, some other method, but more com most commonly streaking a plate, um, to isolate a single colony, okay? And because you want to isolate the particular microbe, you don't want other microbes. So that was the next step. Um, and that became one of the postulates. And then what you would do then was you would take that pure culture that, you know, that you grew and you would, you know, inoculate, essentially, a healthy host. Okay, not the most eth ethical thing to do, but certainly something that went on. So that's, that's what he would do. He would inoculate a, um, a host and he would... Um, See if, and then, of course, when that host got sick, he would, you know, again, extract blood or whatever. He would, you know, look at the microbes and characterize them and see that they were the same microbe, okay? So he would inoculate the healthy growth, and the fourth one, he would reculture the um, strain, the original, the, the strain, to see if it was matched the one that was originally isolated. And if it shows the same characteristics. So that's kind of how he went about it. But again, like I said, there's complications. And the complications are, you know, healthy individuals have normal microbiota. Meaning that we all have a ton of microbes on our body right now. And we probably don't even realize it. And these, you know, microbes colonize our body on the regular basis. They don't cause us any harm either. They actually help protect us. They're one of our immune defenses. Because they tend to secrete say, certain antibiotic type of compounds that prevent other um, microbes from growing. Also, if you have this huge colony on your body, you know, this, these colonies of, of microbes on your body, it's going to be really hard for a pathogenic agent to um, grow because there's just not enough nutrients. There's not enough, you know, there's not enough places to live. There's not enough nutrients, not enough space. So that's a, that's a, that's a bit of an aside. But anyway, you know, healthy individuals have this normal microbiota and, um, there also be, may be, you know, what's called opportunistic pathogens. So sometimes the ones that are colonizing your body are opportunistic pathogens. That means they will, you know, become pathogenic if your immune system is compromised or if your host is compromised in some way. So that's another complication. And of course, we haven't talked about it, but viruses, okay? You might be thinking about viruses um, while, I'm, while I'm talking about this. Um, but the bottom line is some diseases are caused by viruses and um, the virus will not be able to be grown in pure culture. All right. So it's not going to fit these postulates. 
Also, you know, some diseases have only human hosts. I mean, that's the bottom line. Like, I believe the HIV virus um, can only be, you know, inoculated into a human host, which, of course, we can't do. So the only option you have is to study similar diseases in, you know, other organisms or other animals. So those are some of the complications. I'm going to leave it here, and I'll finish up in another video.